I was told never to begin public speaking on a negative note, so I'm going to do just that. <laughs> I want to begin by telling you what these talks are not. I'm not here to give you teaching about Islam, and though I'll be saying quite a lot about it, every Christian needs more information than I'm going to give today. And I'm going to begin by recommending a book by a friend of mine called Patrick Sukdeo, who is a Pakistani ex-Muslim, <coughs> now a wonderful Christian, who has recently gained a PhD for the study of how Christians are being treated in his home country in Pakistan. And he has written a very simple short book <coughs> on a Christian's pocket guide to Islam. It's quite the best and we've got a supply outside and I believe every Christian needs to be informed about the history, teaching and practice of Islam because I'm not here to give that. Secondly, I'm not here to attack Muslims. I am not here to increase fear or hatred of people who believe in Islam. There's enough fear of Muslims already around, and I hope it might be reduced by what I'm going to say. Muslims are people made in the image of God. God loves them, Christ died for them. They are sinners like us needing salvation. And I want to say that right away. I'm afraid they may, I may be accused of racism or Islamophobia. That is not my emotion or my intention. Thirdly, I am not here to talk about evangelism of Muslims. Many others are more experienced than I am in that field, and uh, their advice and wisdom is widely available to us. We are, however, called to serve and save everybody we can. And I want to put the emphasis on the word save, because we don't have a monopoly on service. There are many atheists and agnostics who are engaged in service to their fellow men as much as any Christian. <coughs> what we do have a monopoly on is saving people. We're the only people with a message for the next world for people. And I believe that saving somebody is the greatest service you can render to them because it's of eternal value. Nevertheless, others will deal with that. The challenge is to us Christians, and this message is not directed to the public, and certainly not to Muslims, though I guess it will find the way into their hands, but it's a message to the church in this country. It's a challenge to Christians, because we are now caught up in direct contact, contact with Islam, with the immigration that took place into this country, with their birth rate in this country, with the interests in September the 11th in Islam, which has accelerated astonishingly, we are far more likely to encounter Muslim people in this country now than we were 30 years ago. And so the subject has become part of our thinking. I want to begin with a thumbnail sketch of trends in our society, just to paint the background very quickly and briefly, uh, so that we know where we are. Our society is beset with isms. We're flooded with isms. And I'm allergic to any word that ends with ism, except two, baptism and evangelism. I can cope with those. But all the other isms, including Christian isms, Anglicanism, Methodism, Wesleyanism, Lutheranism, all these isms I'm allergic to. But society is flooded with them. Let's look first at our social life and three isms that have devastated our social life together in this country. Materialism is the most obvious living for the physical world, living for possessions, living for what money can buy. We are a consumer society and that spills over into religion. 
because just as people shop around between supermarkets and different products, they shop around between different churches till they find one they like. And in a consumer society, more people are likely to be found at boot sales than in the shopping mall than in church on Sunday morning. Materialism has gripped our society and of course the essential ingredient for that is money and we have become a money-oriented society. We are at the moment engaged in a spending spree that is knocking house prices up and that spending spree is usually a symptom of insecurity about the future. Insecurity over money. Will my savings keep their value? Will my pension come in? Let's spend it now. The second ism that I feel has taken over our society is hedonism, H-E-D-O-N, hedonism. That's the pursuit of pleasure, happiness, even the pursuit of comfort. And of course the essential ingredient now is health. And we have become a very health conscious society. Because if you haven't your health, how can you enjoy any other pleasure? And so health shops are a feature of the high street as never before. And of course in a hedonistic society, sex will play a major role. The third ism in our social life is secularism. Religion plays less and less part in public life. It's been privatized. It has become a personal hobby pursued in our spare time. It plays less and less part in public life. It's become a leisure interest. And in a recent Gallup poll conducted by the Reader's Digest office, they listed the most godless nations in the world in order. Japan came top of the world nations for godlessness. Now, I don't know how they defined or measured this, but that was their conclusion. The United Kingdom came second in the whole world for sheer godlessness and lack of religion. I throw that out. Let's look at our mental outlook because that's even more important than our social life. The way people think, the way their worldview, and I want to mention three isms that have profoundly affected the way we think in this country. 500 years ago or so, if you asked anybody in this country, how do you find truth? They would have said very simply, it is revealed by God. Truth comes from Him. And if you say, well, how does it come from Him? They would either say through the Bible, if they were Protestant and Northern Europe, or in Southern Europe, they would say through the church. But however the means, the source was the same. God tells us what is true about our universe, about ourselves, about Him, and that's how you find truth. That is now gone. And three isms have destroyed that understanding. The first was rationalism. As part of the Enlightenment, rationalism said truth is discovered by man, not revealed by God. And we discover it with the brain that we have. Our reason finds truth. And only that which is reasonable and can be proved to reason will be accepted as truth. That became, if you can't prove a thing scientifically, it is not true. And so rationalism demanded proof. However, rationalism was cold. It was intellectual, it was cerebral. And there was a reaction against that into what was known as romanticism. Truth is still discovered by human beings, but through their heart rather than their mind through their emotions rather than their thoughts, through, well, more intuitive than intellectual. And Romanticism added this dimension that we discover truth not only with the mind but with the heart. 
But we've moved from that into relativism, which is, to my mind, the greatest difficulty we have to face in our society. Relativism began by believing that truth is discovered not through the heart or mind, but through the will, through choice, through preference. And that led to a complete absence of absolute truth and therefore absolute error. No longer was it true that if this was true, its opposite was false. Black and white became greys of varying shades. Relativism says what is true for you may not be what is true for me. Truth becomes subjective, internal, not out there but in here. And truth is what I believe to be true, what I prefer to be true, what I have found to be true in my experience. And therefore there is very little in common. The most you can do is dialogue about truth and listen to what is true for him and tell them what is true for you. In religion this has devastating consequences. It means nobody has the truth. All they have is what is true for them. And a Muslim and a Christian can meet and a Christian can say in dialogue, this is what is true for me. And the Muslim says, and this is what is true for me. And you simply must end up respecting each other's truth. But there is no truth that is true for him and me. You beginning to follow? And relativism then spills over from truth into moral behavior. And there is no absolute right and wrong now. You choose what is right for you. And you don't try and impose that on anybody else. What is right for you may not be right for him. What is wrong for you may not be wrong for him. Truth and ethics become relative. Shades of gray. In other words, nobody knows the truth. And therefore, anybody who says, I know the truth, is regarded as a bigot, as somebody who is not with it. What is commended is not saying, this is the truth, but saying, I'm still searching for the truth. I'm a pilgrim on the way, and that is profoundly acceptable. But to say I have found the truth, or the truth has found me, is very unacceptable. I turn to the religious side of our society, and all this is oversimplified, but I'm just sketching a broad picture of the background uh, to where we're at. There are two isms that have invaded the religious world. The first is pluralism. Now, we are in a plural society. We're in a multicultural, multi-religious society. Many of us for the first time in our lives. But every country is soon going to be multicultural, multi-religious, with different cultures and religions side by side. Immigration and emigration on a vast scale have produced this diversity. But pluralism, that's an ism, goes further. It doesn't just say we've got to live together in peace. It makes a virtue out of different cultures and different religions. It believes that we are all seeking the same ultimate end, that all religions are basically the same quest for truth. Whether they find it or not, we can share this quest together. Um, Pluralism says that all approaches to religion are equally valid and should be accepted as equally valid. And therefore, in a pluralist society, the two major virtues are tact and tolerance. Neither virtue, of course, is mentioned in the Bible, but political correctness is built on these two virtues. In relation to other cultures, and other religions, tact and tolerance are the supreme attitudes. The other ism in the religious world is syncretism, and it follows from all the other isms I've mentioned. Syncretism is the coming together of all religions for common purpose. And with that syncretism has come an idea that religion 
is not for God, it's for man to discover common values and attitudes. The only time I've heard the Duke of Edinburgh preach in church was in St. George's Chapel, Windsor. And I was surprised that he was the preacher. I'd never heard him preach. And his sermon was very simple. Let all the religions of the world come together to save wildlife. <laughs> and he was a powerful preacher. But it was pure syncretism that for human purposes, the religions must get together. The Pope did the same thing by calling representatives of all different religions to Assisi in Italy, made famous by Francis, to pray for world peace. In other words, when religion is seen primarily for human purposes, then people say, why don't the religions get together? Especially, they said, the three monotheistic faiths of Judaism, Christianity and Islam. If they all believe in one God, why can they not get together for the sake of world peace, to save the environment, for social justice, for all the things that would make human life happier and better? In all that discussion, there is no discussion of doing it for God. It is human-centered and oriented. What can all the religions together do for the human race? And if they stay apart, they are preventing those objectives from being achieved. The result is that in the mass media in our country, in BBC and ITV, they no <coughs> longer make any differentiation between religions when they are planning programs. They talk about the faith community. What does the faith community say about this? What is the faith community? Already they have accepted a syncretistic view of religion. We are all faith people as against non-faith people. And non-faith is defined as the common enemy of And therefore, why can't all believers of different varieties get together to spread faith among the non-faith community and the atheists and agnostics in our country. It was that uh, desire which led Prince Charles to say he wanted to be known as defender of faith. And that was the thinking behind it. For the human purposes of bettering society, it is much better for us to drop our differences and become a solid community of faith to communicate values, personal and public values to society. And incidentally, before some of you throw that title defender of the faith at our royal family, you need to remember that the title was given to King Henry VIII by the Pope because he wrote a book against Luther and the Protestant Reformation. So that in its origin, defender of the faith means defender of the Catholic faith against Protestants. Naughty me loves telling people in Northern Ireland that. <laughs> but uh, don't think that it means defender of the Christian faith. It doesn't. But this is the trend of syncretism. The difference is between faith and non-faith. And the faith community is treated as a unit. Well, now, all that's very much a thumbnail sketch. Alongside all those isms is a sharp decline in Christianity. I call it a hemorrhage. The church has been hemorrhaging for years now. The Church of England was losing a thousand people a week, especially young people, and now more particularly, the latest figures show losing men. And that's a very significant point which will come up later. The Methodists were closing two church buildings a week. Under 5% of the population attend church weekly. There are some glorious exceptions. There are some lively churches 
some a few thousand strong, but when you put them against the background of the population they serve, they are infinitesimal. Yes, you may be able to get a church of two or three thousand in London out of eight to ten million people, and that's probably the same proportion as a village with thirty attending church. We need to get things in proportion. We tend to focus on the successful churches without looking at the context in which those churches are successful. We need to count not those who come to church, but those who don't. And then we're getting a sober analysis. There are some very big black churches. And the greatest move of God in our country at the moment is among gypsies. And uh, I've had real contact with some lovely gypsies. One camp I visit, uh, every caravan has Jesus stickers in the windows. It's an entire Christian gypsy camp. We're not talking about travelers, we're talking about Romanids. And I was sitting in uh, a caravan with Jim, surrounded by children and dogs. We didn't know whose were whose. And one of the gypsy Christians looked at both of us and said, you're gorgeous. <laughs> and I thought, well, I don't know quite how to answer that. I, I'd never had that said to me before. It's their word for non-gypsy. <laughs> it's, it's like the Jewish word Gentile. A gorgia is someone who's not a Romany. And we are gorgeous. <laughs> but it's been a joy to meet them. They call God devil. And in their prayer, devil, devil. I thought, they're praying to the devil. <laughs> Had to learn a whole new language. And among prisons too, there's a real move of God. However, set against the total scene of Britain, it is nowhere near enough salt or light to do its job. This country is post-Christian. We are now in the third and fourth generations that have had nothing to do with the church or the Bible. And this has created a gigantic spiritual vacuum. And the question is, what will fill it? You see, we all of us have a God-shaped blank in our souls. Society has a God-shaped blank. We are people made in the image of God. And that vacuum has to be filled with something or someone. We are by nature worshippers. And what we worship, we become like. Our devotions to a God have a profound effect on our character and our conduct. So what's going to fill this gap? Well, human beings may fill it. We can worship an idol who is a human being. And we've seen examples of this <coughs> in recent weeks. They may come from the field of sport. And when you see a crowd at a key sport event, you are seeing a profound act of worship. I came across this amazing picture of Posh and Bex depicted as Hindu gods. I thought that's a profound statement. It's a very complicated picture full of religious symbolism. But one of the Spice Girls and a footballer become gods and are worshipped widely from the world of sport and the world of entertainment, pop stars, stage and screen provide our deities. But they are very fleeting gods. One defeat in a match is enough to destroy the pedestal. But I'm just pointing out that sports crowds reveal we've got to worship something or something. The spiritual vacuum doesn't remain <coughs> empty. There is a growth in old ancient paganism coming in this country, returning to those <coughs> pagan origins of religion here, which we thought we'd left behind centuries ago. The Harry Potter syndrome is just one straw on that water, but it's aroused a huge interest in witchcraft. Those books are not imagination, 
They are taken straight from modern witchcraft instruction. What else could fill? Occultism could fill. But there is the one other possibility that we are considering today, and that is that one of the other world religions will replace Christianity in this country. And there is one clear candidate for this already within our country, already the second largest religion in our country, and already the fastest growing religion in our country, and that is Islam. So we're not talking about a remote possibility here. It is a world religion. It is the second largest in the world and is growing four and a half times faster than Christianity and therefore is set to overtake it. There are now one and a half billion Muslims in the whole world. One person in every four or five is a Muslim and on present trends by 2055, which isn't all that far ahead, half the global birth rate will be Muslim. And since most people become Muslim by birth, half the entire birth rate of our globe will be Muslim in a decade or two. They began, of course, in the Middle East, sitting on black gold, and that's not an irrelevant factor. It has supplied much resource for the spread of Islam. The petrodollar is a significant factor. 300 million Arabs in the Middle East are Muslim, half of them under the age of 15, the future generation. They have spread from there eastwards into Asia, where there are now nearly 800 million Muslim, not in Arabia, but in Pakistan, India, and further afield, Malaysia, Indonesia, right across the middle belt of Asia. They have spread south into Africa, over 300 million. They have spread north into Europe. There are now 32 million in Europe and uh, I'll come to Britain in a moment, and they have spread west into America. And they are now the second largest and fastest growing religion in America. And have particularly appeal to the Afro-Caribbean population, producing something you've heard of called the Black Muslim Movement. They are the majority now in 45 different countries, especially in Africa and Asia. When I say the majority, I mean over 70%, not over 50, over 70% in 45 different countries, with varying degrees of influence in those countries. Of those countries, according to the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, 25 of their countries are not, sorry, 26 are not free. There are 26 in which the Uni United Nations Declaration of Human Rights does not apply. There are another 13 that are partly free, but only two of them pass the United Nations standards of human rights. That again is a significant statistic. The five largest Muslim countries are Indonesia, Pakistan, Bangladesh, surprisingly India and Iran. We think of India as a Hindu country, but it's also the largest Muslim country, even though Pakistan and Bangladesh were separated off by Lord Louis Mountbatten's last governorship to be Muslim states, leaving India Hindu, but no, India is still in the five largest. Here is a statement made at the opening of an Islamic center in Europe. In the next 50 years, we will capture the Western world for Islam. We have the men to do it. 
we have the money to do it, and above all, we are already doing it. And that is openly stated. It led one of our leading Christian missionaries to say this. He said, anyone who does not become a Christian in the next two decades will probably become a Muslim. Now let's turn from the world scene to the United Kingdom. It is the second largest and fastest growing religion here as most other countries. In 1951, there were only 5,000 Muslims in this country. And the first mosque which had been built, even years before that, was at Woking, a few miles from here. As you take the train from Woking to London, look on the right-hand side, and you'll see a little old mosque, which was the first one built. There are now over two million Muslims, not 5,000, but two million, and that's taken 50 years. Of course, most was by immigration, which was legal when the British Empire was dismantled. Now, most is by illegal immigration. And we know the whole question of the asylum seekers. Many of them are from places like Afghanistan, and they are coming in unofficially. There is also a great deal of growth by marriage, especially English women marrying Muslim men, which is encouraged. My wife and I were in a tiny village in the heart of rural England, and we were discussing the whole situation. I said, well, there can't be much happening here in this little village. And we told that four or five of that little village, four or five women had married Muslims and were now part of the Muslim faith. We were also told, incidentally, that there was an exhibition of Islam in the little village primary school taking place at that very moment. And this was a village where <laughs> you thought Islam wouldn't be anywhere within miles. I'll come back to that. There is conversion going on, even among English people of long standing. Not far from us is a place called Greenham Common. It used to be the air base for <coughs> nuclear weapons of the American Air Force in this country. And I'm sure you heard about the Greenham women who had a protesting Peace Corps living at the main gates. The leader of the Greenham Common Women is now a Muslim and advocating Islam. What a switch. But conversion is happening. They are claiming now that they had 25,000 conversions last year from English people. We'll ask in the second talk why that would happen. But just a little point of interest, Muslims don't talk about converting to Islam. They talk about reverting to Islam because they believe as part of their faith that all of us in this room were born as natural Muslims. And therefore, we have fallen away from our birthright. And when we go back to Islam, we are not converting, we are reverting to what was originally in us at our birth. I just throw that out so you won't hear them talking about converts to, to Islam. The birth rate, of course, at least a third of the Muslims uh, in this country were born here. And the birth rate is very considerably higher than uh, Anglo-Saxon birth rate. Now all this led the Bishop of London to say that by 2004 there will be more Muslims than Anglicans in this country. I would question the 2004, I think it's already happened because there are 700,000 practicing Anglicans and 700,000 practicing Catholics and 700,000 practicing free churchmen. It's neck and neck between the three main groups and all that adds up to 2,100,000, which is 
which is the exact number of Muslims in this country. Well, there are many straws on the water. I just run through them. Two mosques a week being opened. I read one book that questioned that figure and said it's more like one every two weeks. You can take either figure, but either figure is astonishing. I think many people here became aware of uh, Islam when Salman Rushdie had a fatwa or death sentence pronounced on him for a book entitled The Satanic Verses. A rather humorous incident happened with that. Our police at great cost hid him, protected him, and had to move him from one security house to another. And on one of those moves he was lying on the floor in the back of a police car covered with a police greatcoat. And it passed the big mosque in Regent's Park and broke down right outside the mosque. <laughs> and it was with great difficulty that it got it going again, got into some new hiding place. But people reading about all this in the paper says, what's going on in this country? Princess Diana, and as we know, came within a hair's breadth of introducing Islam into our royal family. I do not believe that her death in the car crash was a conspiracy by anyone. But I have to say I was relieved that that relationship didn't proceed any further. The Queen opened a two million pound festival of Islamic faith and Prince Philip sponsored a seven million trust to produce the first authorized English version of the Quran. Now I believe our royalty does have an obligation to recognize all parts of those who are part of their kingdom and therefore must be fair to different groups. However, I object to someone in that position being the head of a church. It's incompatible to be the head of a Christian church and yet to be having to act that way. The royal family is under great pressure. John Major as Prime Minister, our previous Prime Minister, opened a 12 million multimedia centre in London for spreading Islam by every possible means of the media. Charles, as I've told you, wants to be defender of faith and that is partly because he is very sympathetic to the Muslim faith for reasons which I'll tell you later. The media, especially since September the 11th, has given unprecedented publicity to Islam to reassure people that Islam had nothing to do with the atrocities on September the 11th and has given unprecedented publicity. I wish it would give as much opportunity for Christians to preach and not just sing hymns or put on spectacular shows. I have a newspaper cutting here which labeled the attraction of Islam says this, with more programs planned, Channel 4 is turning into the voice of British Islam. And week after week after week I was recording programs to prepare this talk, which were uncensored, total freedom for the Muslim faith to be explained and propagated. In politics, 23% of our bank reserves are petrodollars. And if they, we so offended the Muslim cause that they withdrew their money from our banks, we are in serious trouble. It is not just investment coming in. Our export market is very dependent, especially on military arms to Muslim countries. So our economy 
has become very tied up. I was speaking last week to a lawyer, a solicitor, who found himself conveying hotels and businesses to Arabs in London, and he just said, you would be absolutely astounded if you knew how much that in the city of London is already in Muslim hands. So the question comes, could Islam become a major religion here? Could it become the main religion? Well, some people say it is possible, others say it is probable, but I have a rather different answer that I'm going to give. But first, let me quote from the main speaker at the opening of the largest mosque in Western Europe, namely in Regent's Park in London. And he said this, if we win London for Islam, it won't be hard to win the whole Western world. And the target is London. They see they, London as the gateway to Europe and the European community. There is more hope for them to become a force here than anywhere else in Europe, though there are Muslims in many other countries. Incidentally, the mosque in Regent's Park was built by a building contractor called Ling, which was a Christian foundation. A member of the Brethren, Sir John Ling, <coughs> built up one of the most successful building contractors in this country. You must have seen Ling on many a, a mobile crane. Well, he had gone by the time they built that mosque. But Ling's construction company with thousands of employees was recently sold for one pound. It has become a worthless outfit bought by an Irish firm. Well, will Islam fill the spiritual vacuum in Britain? I have a very clear answer for you, but I must explain how I came to it. I have been preparing this talk for months, but I have been prepared for it for years. Some of you who used to listen to me in Guildford have reminded me of the prediction I made way back in the 1970s, early 1970s, that the real challenge to Christianity is not communism, but Islam. Very few people took me too seriously then because they thought that's overseas, that's uh, a problem for the missionaries. But in fact now, the t situation is totally different. And looking back over the decades, indeed it goes back beyond the 70s, every decade something has happened to me that has brought me nearer to this day. Back in the 50s, I was a Royal Air Force chaplain and got into trouble with the authorities in my first six months for cancelling parade services, which brought the men to worship in a frame of mind that was totally alien. And uh, our services were released when men weren't subject to an hour's parade in their best uniform before they worshipped. But that didn't go down with the authorities. And I was posted to Aden and found myself, for the first time in my life, in an alien culture that I had no experience of before, never thought about it. I was woken up early by the call to prayer, the muezzin, because my wife and I lived inside the extinct crater of a volcano in an Arab township that you reach through a tunnel in the volcano rim. If any of you have been to crater, you may know it. And there we were really confronted, for example, not only with prayers, but prayers at street corners. I never understood Jesus' words about praying at street corners till I got there. And men would unroll a mat and pray in the middle of the street, which is terribly un-English, isn't it? <laughs> it was there that I first encountered a thief who stole a piece of fruit in a market and had his hand just chopped off and the stump plumbed into pitch to cauterize it. And I tell you, I was 
sick for weeks. It was there that I was on a balcony and looked down into the street and saw a naked girl being dragged by her hair through the dust by a group of excited men and I wanted to intervene. I said to my friends on the balcony, we must go down and do something. They said, don't you dare. That's the law. She's going to be stoned for adultery, which of course is the same as the Mosaic law in your Bible. It was there that I learned that during Ramadan, the fast is only during the day and at night they can eat as much as they want, which had a devastating effect on the digestive system. And we had to be jolly careful how we walked <laughs> during Ramadan. Tempers were on edge. As chaplain of the ODs, the other denominations, I had to look after Muslim men in the Royal Air Force and make sure they didn't get any breakfast tainted by bacon or bacon fat. And above all, it was there that any Muslim baptized in the name of Jesus signed his death warrant. That really shook me. What is it about baptism that is so important to the Muslim? And I realized that I had to go back to my Bible and find out what baptism was all about. And I found out that Muslims have a better understanding of Christian baptism than Christians. And that incidentally led me to the decision that I could never moisten another baby. But that's another story. That was in the 50s. In the 60s, I paid two visits to Israel. The first was purely to get photographs for Bible teaching. And I treated Israel as an open-air museum, as many tourists do, and was put off by the people there. Do you know what I mean? Why are the people here? I want photographs. Why are they trying to sell me postcards? I want photographs for the Bible teaching. But the second time I went was right at the close of the Six-Day War. Found myself in an army jeep up on the Golan Heights, talking to a major. I said, how did you get up here with Russian guns pointing at you? He just went. And I realized after that visit that the war in the Middle East is not political, it's religious. It's a war between two religions and two gods. And that began to make me think. In the 70s, I began to warn my congregation it's not communism, but Islam. Particularly at that time, I said the Shah of Persia will fall because at the 2,500th anniversary of the Persian Empire, he gave himself a new title, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. I said, God won't. God won't stand for that. A few months later, gone. And the Ayatollah Khomeini has taken over. In the 80s, I went to visit a Muslim country and was told I wouldn't get in because on in my passport, there were 16 Israeli stamps. And when I got to the immigration, and some of you know which country it was, when the immigration officer took my passport, I just said, Lord, blind his eyes. And he took my passport and opened every page, but he stared into the distance. <laughs> <laughs> and I got in. I've changed my passport now. My wife and I went during that decade to take part in a Christian march on the Saturday between Good Friday and Easter Sunday. And as we drove through London, down the Mile End Road, we passed a huge new mosque at 12 o'clock on Good Friday. And suddenly it opened and out poured hundreds of mature, handsome, strong men. The women had to go out the back. And they held up the traffic, and I studied them. Then we went on to march with the Christians, and I couldn't help but notice the contrast. There were far fewer men in the Christian march, and either older men or very young men. Men in their prime were missing. And I thought, which is likely to take over? In the 90s, there came to London Ahmed Didat, he is the, or was the greatest Muslim propagandist they had, I think. I would say in manner, personality and appearance, a cross between Billy Graham and John Stott. 
And he came and booked the Royal Albert Hall and said, I challenge any British Christian to debate with me the rival merits of Christianity and Islam. And I had a phone call from the Evangelical Alliance, Clive Calver, who was then the director, said, David, will you do it? I said, look, I, I know something about Ahmed Dida. He is brilliant. He is very clever. I said, I'll give you some names of people who could do it. And he came back and he said, none of them will do it. We're relying on you, will you? I finally said yes and spent a few sleepless nights. And then when the event was advertised, my name was not on the advertisement. And another name was there in my place. And I rang the alliance and said, I'd be very relieved if you got someone else, but you didn't, <coughs> didn't tell me you'd changed speakers. And they said, oh, well, um, we think uh, he, he would be more appropriate. I said, well, who is he? I've never heard the name. They said he's an American, a Lebanese evangelist. And they said, we thought it would be suitable to have an Arab confront Ahmed Dibet. Well, I said, I think you've made a very big mistake. Christians won't turn up when they don't know someone. They will turn up to support someone they know. And of course, that proved to be the case. And my wife and I got in a car and went up to the Royal Albert Hall on the night. We couldn't get in. There were hundreds and hundreds of Muslims all around the hall who couldn't even get in themselves. And I said, let's go round to the stage door and we'll get in saying I, I should have been the speaker. <coughs> anyway, as we went round, an Arab stopped me and said, uh, you're David Porson, you came to our village in Lebanon. I said, yes. He said, you're coming in for the big fight. And I said, uh, we can't, haven't got tickets. And he said, I've got two spare. So an Arab gave us two tickets and we got in. The place was solidly Muslim. And the American evangelist, I'm afraid Ahmed Dida wiped the floor with him. Just totally demolished him. I was so angry, so ashamed, so afraid, uh, well, so frustrated. I wanted to get up and shout and say, I was due to speak and I'm going to speak. But I'm afraid it was a dreadful occasion. And word went round England, Ahmed Didat has challenged the Christians. He began by saying, couldn't you find an English Christian to debate with me? It was a shameful event. There it was. Some people have told me you were saved from it because that American evangelist, his ministry was ruined that night and he's never ministered again. His son committed suicide a day or two later. So maybe I was saved. Now we're in the 2000s and 9-11, as the Americans call September the 11th, is on us. Since then, there has been widespread interest in Islam. I made a tape five days after the event. We had to produce about 10,000 copies. It's gone round the world. Do get that tape if you haven't had it, but the seeds of today were in it. But now I come to the climax. A few months ago, I went to a meeting, ostensibly to give us information about Islam. And that was all it was. It was to help Christians to understand and appreciate. In the middle of that meeting, totally unexpectedly, I was overwhelmed with the thought that we were not dealing with a possibility or a probability, but a certainty. And I just couldn't cope with it. I didn't mention it for weeks. But I thought, oh, England, Islamic, when you've got children, grandchildren. I, I was just overwhelmed and finally <coughs> said, Lord, is that from you? And if so, why would you tell me? And I heard this, because my church is unready and unaware. So I began to question the Lord further. In what way are we not ready? How can we be ready? In what way are we weak? And I've had daily revelation ever since, which I've scribbled down. But a revelation from the Lord must be weighed and judged by others and tested. And so I ran it past about two dozen Christian leaders in this country. I'll only mention one by name. 
I went to Joel Edwards, who heads up the Evangelical Alliance. I said, Joel, can I run something past you? He said, yes. I said, I believe England will become Islamic. And he stared at me for about a minute. And then he just said, you're right, David. I hope that people would say you're crazy, forget it. They didn't. They urged me to share what the Lord has been giving me and said, you must give this message. Uh, I've never had so many people volunteering to put my neck on the blocks. <laughs> and I just hope they will support me publicly as they have done privately. But I was urged to share the message you're going to hear today. Finally, in this talk, I said, Lord, is there a scripture that would give me a framework for what I need to say that would enlighten me? And he said, yes, Habakkuk. Now that's a prophet I've majored on over the years, but never in this connection. There is nothing about Islam in the Bible, because Islam came later. However, Habakkuk said, Lord, I'm concerned about the state of your people. They're compromised, they're, they're mixed up, they're not faithful. What are you doing about the state of your people Israel? And God said, it's all right, Habakkuk. Habakkuk actually said, you're doing nothing. But God said, no, Habakkuk, I am. I'm bringing the Babylonians. And that was too much for Habakkuk. He said, no, just a moment. That is much too radical. That's too drastic. And God said, no, it isn't. Habakkuk said, but you're of purer eyes than to behold a nectar. You couldn't let them. They're worse than we are. And they won't leave any of us left. They'll wipe us all out. And God said, oh, no. The just shall live by faith. And I'll deal with the Babylonians later. And Habakkuk finished praising God that even if they come and do their worst, I will rejoice in God my Savior. And I've got my scripture. And I earnestly urge you to get my exposition of Habakkuk on table video because I believe it's the key to the whole burden I'm sharing with you today. David Borsonin mittava raamatun selitysteos Unlocking the Bible on nyt saatavilla suomeksi. Tila Raamattu avautuu teoksen vanha testamenttiosuus nyt. Saat uutta testamenttia käsittelevän kakkososan myöhemmin, kun käännös valmistuu.